So last week we heard in our reading that the disciple Peter said he'd never deny Jesus. Yet there he was just after Jesus' arrest, as Jesus predicted, denying Jesus three times. One of the things about preaching is, if you're listening to God in your preparation, he often does something to try and help you live out the verse. On a good week, it might be that you get to be part of a healing or sharing the gospel. But it's not a good week when Jesus, when, when God gives you an opportunity to reflect on your mistakes. But you know, I've been having a good couple of weeks. We've launched Breakfast Church and we taught on our first Sunday about the Good Samaritan. And we made Super Samaritan badges and to wear on the inside of our coats so that wherever we went, we knew that we too could be Super Samaritans. And then during the following week, I was in the city centre and we'd been doing some kingdom work and I'd been praying bold prayers for Jesus. I'd even put my dog collar on for the occasion. And as we were going, get, going home, I was walking back to church with my daughter and I saw someone familiar, um, except they were clearly not very well. And as we got closer, walking along the pavement, there was a wall, the person that was unwell was in front of us, and a car. And they suddenly projectile vomited all over the pavement. And I had three things in my head. COVID, my daughter, and oh my goodness, I think I'm going to be sick. And in a slick movement, I took my daughter by the elbow and we moved around the vehicle to the other side so that we passed that person. I was walking quickly, I was looking down and I was taking some deep breaths of fresh air. And then it hit me. It was like I could see Jesus looking straight at me. And I thought, some super Samaritan you are, Julia. The next day, my daughter asked me, what, what are we going to be doing at breakfast church this week, Mum? Jesus loves the little children, I say. She rolls her eyes with a cheeky smile on her face and mutters, give me strength. This part of Peter's story is so significant because it helps us understand the rest of Peter's life and his faithfulness as a disciple of Jesus. And so today we go, we go beyond Lent so that we can reflect on the way in which Peter grows in resilience and maturity to learn from those lessons and help us as disciples in our own journey. So we're going to fast forward in Peter's story a week or so after Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. Peter's back in his fishing boat with his friends for another, for another unsuccessful night of fishing. Not a single minnow was caught all night long. And the next morning, um, a man appears on the shore and he calls out, Friends, did you catch anything? And the fishermen, they, they own up to their own failure and say, no, we didn't. And the man on the shore, he says, well, cast your net on the other side. And that's what they do. And lo and behold, the nets become full of fish. Recognising the signs of this miraculous catch, the fishermen, they realise that it is the Lord. So Peter, he puts his fishing coat on, he dives straight into the water and he swims to the shore to be with his Lord. And as the friends, they turn up on the boat with the catch, they notice the smell of fish and bread already toasting on the fire. This is the third time that they'd seen Jesus alive since he was raised from the dead. This time Jesus invites them to have breakfast to sit, eat and break bread together. And as we meet our reading today, we see how Peter's story continues to unfold and how this good news of Jesus being alive brings healing and restoration to Peter and those he goes on to meet. And this all comes about through Peter's choice to be faithful. So I'm gonna pass over to Ellie who's out in the garden and she's going to pick up our reading at John chapter 21, verses 15 to 
to 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him for the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you, where you wanted. But when you are older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. No one's denying that Peter messed up. The memories are there, breaking bread like at the Last Supper, when Peter felt so confident that he'd never deny Jesus. The smell of those burning coals reminding him how, in the end, he had failed his God. There are always reminders of the struggles we've had, old sores, old wounds, a trust broken, a lie told, a poor decision, a dream crushed, a law breached, a foolish word spoken. Perhaps it's in a place or a smell or a sound or in a particular person. They can bring up that pain of the failure and have the potential to make you plummet again. But these things need to be dealt with. Realities need to be faced so that we can receive the help that we need from the Lord. Now Jesus, he's, a, he's alone with Peter and he goes to where the pain is in a surprising way. Jesus doesn't ask, well, are you sorry for what you've done? Will you promise never to do it again? Didn't I tell you so? He doesn't need to. Instead, there is healing in this dialogue. He asks Peter, do you love me? Jesus is, is using the ancient Greek word for, for love here, agape, expressing an unceasing, unselfish type of love. Jesus is asking, do you love me that much? It's, it's a question for all of us. Do you love Jesus? I love that Jerry knows the answer to that question every morning when he wakes up. He worship, he gives thanks, receives his blessing. He has the best breakfast with the Lord every day. And I remember the first time that I felt like I really loved Jesus. It was watching the miracle maker. And I don't know why, but there was something in the way Jesus was expressed through those puppets that helped me to really see Jesus, who he is and who he was with, with people he met. And I just knew that I, I loved him. But honestly, much of the time, and I should imagine for most of us, I find the question not so easy to answer. I guess it's because the question is the wrong way round. And it, it might be more helpful to ask, how much does Jesus love you? Well, he loves you enough to go to the cross for you so that you can be freed from every regret, every mess up. Because of course, forgiving is never just a matter of words. Someone has to pay for the damage. Jesus knew that. He paid that debt on the cross. Do you love me? When I was younger, my mum used to ask that question, do you love me? And I'd always say, duh, of course I love you, mum. And she'd say, oh, do you really? And I'd 
say, yes, of course I love you. And then she'd say, oh, you love me. And I'd always used to laugh at this little exchange, partly because I'd moved down south and I thought it was incredibly northern, but also because she always seemed surprised at the response. Like I might have said something different to the last time that she'd asked me. Now it might be hard for you to believe, but I'm not a perfect daughter. Particularly in my earlier years, my mum can certainly vouch for that. But just in the asking, it was a reminder that whatever had gone on between us, we loved each other. Jesus asked Peter this question three times. The first two times Jesus asked the question, do you love me? Peter says to Jesus, you know that I love you. And on the third time, Peter, um, he was grieved by it. And it, he, of course, understood the significance of being asked the third time, a plain reminder, of course, of the previous three-time denial. And so he says, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter understood that, that Jesus knew him better than Peter knew himself. And of course, Jesus did know that he loved him. But perhaps it was Peter that needed to know. This is important because love is foundational and fundamental to who we are. Because God is love and we are made in his image. And we need our love tanks filled. But when we mess up, our knee-jerk reaction is to perceive rejection whether the rejection is real or not. And when we feel re rejection, we can spiral to self-condemnation and more sinful mess-ups and so on and so on. Being resilient means we make space for Jesus to ask us questions, show us any areas of our lives where we might, that we might need to make right so that he can show us how he loves us and bring healing. Chapman talks about the Japanese art of kintsugi, which literally means golden repair. No doubt the inspiration for Chapman's book cover. Now, if we break a teapot or a vase, the temptation is to call it useless and throw it away. But the art of kintsugi repairs the pottery and joins the fragments together with liquid gold. The restoration process makes the pottery unique and more beautiful and precious. God has a way of turning things round. Things that are broken, he transforms them. Paul said to the Romans, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is God's promise to us. Not everything is good to start off with. It can be broken and a mess, but God can use those things for good. Rick Warren has made a list of different ways that he uses the, the bad stuff for good, which I think is quite helpful. So I'm just going to share that with you now. He turns my hurts into holiness. He turns my wounds into wisdom. He turns my pain into gain. He uses correction to bring me into perfection. He uses offences to remove my pretenses. He uses my bruises for good. The bruises aren't good, but he can use the bruises for good. We may prefer never to have been broken into fragments to begin with. But he can transform those broken pieces so that they become, can become more unique, more beautiful and precious. And Jesus turns this whole thing around for Peter. He says to Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter's not out of a job. Jesus doesn't tell him to stay out of the way in case he messes it all up again. Jesus gives him work to do. He restores 
Peter. The call to become fishers of men happened at that very same sea. And now he gives him more. Feeding and looking after lambs and sheep. Jesus is sharing his own work and gives the call to be a shepherd. Looking again at Romans 8, the very next verse tells us why God makes this promise. So that all in God's family will be like Jesus. It's all about your character and identity in Jesus. That's what Julie needed to understand to restore her brokenness. And with the help of the Holy Spirit and prayer and some good friends, she knows she's loved and she can get up when she falls. She absolutely is love and gentleness. Is why Peter made such a good leader. Because he understood that his position of leadership was built not on his own strength, but on his brokenness. And the rest of the conversation we pick up at verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Well, there was no misunderstanding on Peter's part. Peter would spend the rest of his life as a shepherd. He loved Jesus and looked after his sheep, aware of his brokenness and the, the painful knowledge of his own death. Peter is ready now to answer the call, follow me. And we too have that invitation, follow me. Maybe it's news. Um, the first time you've heard Jesus say it and you need to decide whether you are in. Well, like Peter, you're hearing it all over again. Follow me. The question is, are you still all in and following Jesus? So we're going to spend some time now waiting on Jesus, waiting on the Holy Spirit. And I wonder...